real core. And they were all over the city. And so the neighborhoods, you, were, you had your allegiances to the different Turnverines. And so the Turnverines, because they were all about sports, they also had teams, right, that, that went out and competed. And the Southwest Turnverine went to the Olympics. They sent a really strong team to the Olympics in 1904. And once they they, they uh, competed in all of the like the tug of war and disc throwing and all those kinds of uh, track and field type, not running, but uh, those kinds of sports. And there ended up being this scandal where they had a challenge for their medals once they were given out and it was on a national, it was a national news. They challenged uh, a team from New York for them and they ended up getting the silver and bronze medals in the tug of war. So it was like, it was like a big story, a big national story, this tug of war. Um, drama. And so then they, so they have the silver and, and bronze, they challenge the whole thing, and then they get, they go home with the gold. Um, another cool thing about Southwest Turnverein that has some neat Olympic history is there's a guy named Frank Kugler, who's in this photo to the left. He's one of the, <laughs> one of the, the tug of war people there. Frank Kugler is still one of the, he's one of the only Olympians to ever medal in three different, uh, gold medals in three different sports. So he holds some big Olympic history there from the Southwest Turnverein. And there's still Turnvereins around town. That is still something that people can belong to. Let me check, I'm gonna move from this spot. Anybody has a question about, about these? If you go to uh, Forest Park and you, looking at, if you're at the bottom of Art Hill and you're looking up and you go off to the left, you know, around on the walking path. And if you've ever seen that statue kind of hiding out behind the trees, it's the big guy with a big giant beard and it's like a lady with a pole. And that's the guy that founded Turnerism. So his name, uh, he founded it in Austria, but uh, that's what that's all about. Those are all German connections. All right. The chat, no questions? Okay, we're going to move. So from here, take this to, we're gonna leave this spot. We're gonna go towards downtown. And this is one that you guys, you know, other groups that I do this presentation for, this part is like a total surprise and shock and I have to explain a lot. And I feel like you probably um, may, may not have to, but the next thing we're gonna look at was inspired by this little plaque. that I'm gonna zoom in on a little bit here. I found this, Several years ago, I was downtown and I was going for a walk after my lunch break and I saw this plaque and the plaque is, is um, talking about this big achievement on the city's part and I've always, I'd always wanted to know more. And so I went and searched for it when I was putting this one together and it's all, the plaque is from 1953 and it's all in praise of this effort, this bond issue and this effort to complete the the completion of this huge citywide project of elevating train tracks at grade crossings throughout the city. And so this is like the culmination of it. Um, and I have, let's see here. There is, here is that same spot um, in the early, very early 20th century. But I love this. So this is the municipal bridge. This was this bridge was built to compete with them. Um, compete with the Eads Bridge. It was a free bridge versus the Eads that had a toll. So, but originally before this was elevated, those would have crossed, you know, at the street level. So, you know, as a modern St. Louisan, it took me a minute to wrap around the idea of grade crossings and that being a, you know, a real issue. Um, you know, it's, it's a place where the train, freight train or regular train crosses um, at street level. Um, this was something that all American cities were dealing with in the early 20s the late 19th century. Um, and it's still a bit of a concern, but nothing like, like it was then. Um, when I went looking for this, I found so much of these, these dramatic, you know, stories of families in their cars and train wrecks and all of this stuff. Um, and these are all just from St. Louis papers here. So the movement pushed in the 1920s is when the city finally like, gathers some money to get this done across the city and do in this big effort to do it. Um, as they're doing that, the big question, the big issue with this, with the grade crossing projects, is who's gonna pay for it? Is it the city on the behalf of the car that pulls out in front of the train? Or is it the train's problem for hitting the car? 
It's like legally who, who is at fault when these things happen? And so that they go back and forth about that. And it turns out differently in different situations. The one on the right is a grade crossing that's at a really familiar spot in St. Louis. That is Del Mar and Hodiamont. So that's on the loop. And this was one of the more dangerous ones. Um, and what's interesting in studying these is that it's not just that you know, a car would race across the tracks and the train would hit it or somebody wasn't watching, is that a car or a streetcar would patiently wait, the train would go by, and then they turned, but the whole time they had never heard there was a second train coming or there was one coming from the, you know, a, a faster train coming from the opposite way. So you just have all of these really um, interesting stories of, of how this would happen. So one of the solutions, one of the things that the big projects that also came out of this, other than the elevated ones downtown, is the Wabash train station on Del Mar, which is now the you know, empty train station above the Metrolink station. Um, and this was, so Wabash, the Wabash train company paid for train uh, railroad line, they paid for that station. And the lines are original. So the ones that run underneath it, that's where they were originally. And so instead of bringing, you know, elevating the lines, they chose to elevate the street and create a viaduct. And so the lines would go underneath. That was the train station that would serve it. Um, something they really touted in this project is that they never slowed a single train down in building that and straddling, you know, and building and straddling that city. And so that is a viaduct that you're driving over there. Um, and it was a huge project and saved a lot of lives because that was one of the more dangerous of the spots. Any questions on that before we move? It's something cool by if you're seeing the, the image in the upper right of this collection here, double-decker buses. We've got streetcars and double-decker buses heading up and down Delmar, um, and same thing here. Love to have some of those saved, drive around in. So our next location of a building that we're not going to go very far this time either is we're going to go just a little bit further up the street. So I'm going to fly out. I'm going to go a little bit east on Delmar, not very far, to a little cluster of buildings. And this is the building that had I mean, they all have surprising histories. They wouldn't have made it on here, but I can't help but say that over and over again. So this building, which is now apartment buildings, mixed use, was originally the, the Del Monte or Del Monte um, Theater. And this was a huge place. It seated 3,000 people in its auditorium. When it was built, it was the largest in the world of that type of movie house. Um, it... It, they hosted fashion shows, it held all these big events that would happen happen there. Um, it was fully furnished by Sticks, Bauer and Fuller. So all local you know, furniture made and by a local uh, department store. And then here is some advertising. Here's the inside of that auditorium, the movie house. And then this is one of the early plays uh, written by Fanny Hurst, who's a local, who was a local playwright. And she's from St. Louis um, and with Alma Rubin. So this is some cool, cool classy stuff that was happening there at the Del Monte Theater. So go back to that and I'll do that um, one more time. All right, Any, I've got a question. Does the Cheshire Inn own the buses now? I don't know, that's a good question. Um, I know that there's one around town, I've seen it, but I don't know if it's, those look kind of British, I don't know if they're, uh, their vintage St. Louis one. That's a good question. I actually know, know someone who owns the Cheshire, so that gives me a reason to ask. All right, next place. Oh, the address of the Del Monte building. I don't have the address in front of me. It is about two, like I said, it's about two blocks, um, two blocks east of where the Wabash train and the Metrolink station is. Okay, so now we're gonna fly across town and we're gonna to go to, we're gonna go to Soulard. Okay, 
you can see, and this is a Google Earth image. This building is not under construction at the moment. Um, so this originally was the was a German. It's called the Bohemian Gymnasium is the name for this building. Um, and it is originally there was a so a German gymnasium, which was not a term of Orion, but kind of close to it. And then it served the Czechoslovakian uh, community, which was heavy, heavily located in this area. Um, and there was a beer garden here, and then the Czechoslovakian society took it over and had it as a social space as well. And then it was the Smile Soda factory, which is why you see the tile around the, wrapped around the outside that says Smile Soda, and it has that sign there. Um, and then it was a roller rink in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And now it's offices. So what I love about this is go there. Okay. So in the 1896 tornado, thank you, Mara. Um, so in the 1896 tornado that swept through St. Louis and you know one of the deadliest tornadoes in the US history, and our deadliest, not our costliest, but our deadliest tornado in St. Louis history, you know, it swept through um Soulard, and there are so many great photographs of the damage and um just are lots of great resources to see in this. And but this building here, it blew off the front like in that chunk. But if you look at the building now, the you can see the repair that they made on the building in 1896. And this is just one that on our walking tours, people love seeing this. We're, you know, we're always in search of kind of that, those connections. And so there's a connection to the 830 years ago. Um, and you can see the changes that they made. They added, a, you know, that lip at the top, and and you can see, see right in here where that repair was made. Everything above there, the buildings back here also still standing and look exactly the same. They were fully repaired as well. Okay. Any questions on that one? We're going to move on to kind of a different. Thing. So we're not going to fly around anymore. Um, our next thing that we're going to do is we're going to okay. So we're going to go to um, Bell Fountain Cemetery for a second. Um, this spot I came about because I am someone who, when I go to Bell Fountain, I you know I don't look at the map with the the walking thing, which is that's all fine and good. I like to just kind of set off in a direction and find you know tell you know find stories and find things as I'm digging through. This is my favorite one I've ever. These are all my favorites. They're not catching on. I said it a lot, but this is one of one of the coolest ones I ever came across. It's a huge stone. It's out in the middle of a bunch of just you know random. There's not there's not a sign on this or anything. One side of it says this is in memory of Joseph White, and it talks about how he's um, you know buried at, at First Presbyterian in downtown St. Louis. But if you go to the other side of it, it says this monument was removed from Old Presbyterian burial ground. On Franklin Avenue, and beneath here are all the remains of the people that were removed. So this is a mass grave underneath this, and when I say mass, I mean 5,000 people are underneath this one stone, and this is confirmed by uh, Dan at the at Bell Fountain. And there's thousands of people underneath here, and that's that's all that's interesting enough. So I go looking for this. Like when did they move them and why did they move them and all this stuff? And I found an article in from 1865 from the New York Times where they're writing about this thing that St. Louis is doing, moving all these people to the cemeteries, moving all these bodies out of the moving the bodies out of the city cemeteries. And for this one, there's a New York Times article about it, this particular one, and it talks about the men who are paid to move the bodies are not paid like daily, like here's your money for the day, they are paid by getting to keep whatever they find on the bodies. Most of the people that were buried were buried during the cholera epidemics. And when people are buried, during cholera epidemics, you are buried with what you have on. Nobody's gonna eat it, they wanna touch you. It's, it's a very, you know, they didn't know what to do so these bodies are just kind of dumped. So they find gold, money, jewelry. They find things sewn into people's clothing because you know, at that time, most common people didn't have a bank account or a place to like, they had to keep all of their valuables on them. So they find lots of money and lots of things on, they find French coins, they find you know, all these different things. But then they come across this woman who is, and it says in the thing, she's in well, good condition, which is kind of weird, but, and her coffin is glass fronted, glass topped. So they can see in, 
They come across this coffin and this lady is covered in gold jewelry and ornate clothing, like they have found a queen or a princess. And they think, the men say they've got $5,000 worth of stuff that they have found with her. Except it turns out that none of it's real. It's all costume jewelry and, co and it's her costume. She was an actress who was killed on stage in one of the, old, the you know, historic theaters when a beam or you know, something fell from the rafters and hit her. And so she was buried in her stage clothes. Um, I cannot find who that actress was. Would love to know more about that whole thing. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's a part of that story is that, um, that they found this lady um, covered in gold. And this is still, you know, moving bodies out. You know, so a lot of you may well know it's still a thing. They still find bodies and, and human remains in downtown St. Louis where the old city cemeteries were. And most, uh, I know Bell Fountain and Calvary have places for those remains that are uh, connected to the original cemetery. All right, question. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna head to a couple of just common intersections and we're gonna do some time travel back and forth. So we're in Grand Center for this one. I do a walking tour of Grand. It's interesting to me. It was not a place I ever thought a walking tour would be. Uh, you do because you just kind of think of everything's Grand Avenue and everything's right there, but I ended up finding tons of great stuff back in there. And here is a, a photo of that exact same intersection in the early 20th century. You have the Missouri Theater, the On God Arts Hotel is, the Walgreens, the Sunkist. I love the Sunkist ad. And you have the unit, what's called the University Club, which is one of the big business clubs. Private clubs is right here. And this box is down there. I'm gonna do that we'll turn one more time. Okay. All right, the next spot we're gonna head to is 14th and Chestnut Street. So we're looking, you know, towards the arch. You guys all know where this is. Um, at the Court of Honor across from the uh, Soldiers Memorial. And here's an image that I got as perfectly lined up as I could of that corner. Um, in the early 20th century. And I love this image just because it shows how dense that area was, or it gives a little sliver of how densely populated that area was with shops and you know, it would have been apartments above it and people walking and coming and going. Okay. And the next spot is Shoto and Grand. Um, it's so, I deal so much with the history of the Chateau family that, Spain Shoto always sounds kind of strange to me because I'm not from St. Louis, so I wasn't raised saying that. But it's Shoto and Grand, the Captain D's is. Um, and I found a photo from the early, very well, you know, early 20th century. We got good cars in this photo, but it was always a corner to stop and grab lunch. So this is that exact same intersection, and we've got this guy out in the middle, the policeman directing traffic with streetcar lines. And if you zoom in on that. Love this. The you know the advertisements for free road maps, the sandwiches, the hot fish sandwich for ten cents. Um, it's just kind of in the gas pump off to the left as well. So yeah, fancy Captain D's was originally it was originally that. <laughs> okay, I've got a chat. I'm gonna check that real quick. Thank you. Yeah, this is my. I love doing these things. Um, if any, if any of you are on Instagram and if you're not following, there's a really good Instagram follow called Arch City History. And it's a guy, he works at Historical Society, but he is incredible at finding pictures of Saint, you know, historic St. Louis and he colorizes them. And then he's also doing some work and showing kind of a back and forth of then and now that it's pretty astounding. It's heartbreaking also. Next, we're going to move a little bit, a little bit east from there on the Jefferson. This is a building passed by a million times, probably this week, and driving around running errands, and I would never have known the history. And before I say what it is, I'd love to ask trivia to the group. Does anybody know the history of this building and what was here very recently? 
get it right, get it panned in. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard to. I'm gonna watch the chat for a second. See if anybody knows what was there. No, not a fire station. So this building was originally was a veterinary infirmary building. So there's that. That's how it served the. That's why you got the big door, taking horses in and out. Um, that's how it would have served the. The uh, this building built in 1896, and that's how it would have <clears throat> originally served the neighborhood. However, it's opened in 19 in 1945. There is a man who is the first African American to graduate with an advanced degree from Cornell University. He purchases this building, and he opens a company called the Do Good Chemical Manufacturers. And they had different names throughout their time. Um, he Do Good Chemical Manufacturers was open from 1947 to 2011. So this is a huge history that this building has and this man's work that was doing, being done here. He chose to start his own company because he, when he graduates from Cornell, he gets great job offers, except because he was light-skinned, he was told, you know, he was told um, explicitly that he would not be able to hire any black workers to work with him and that he himself could kind of pass as white. So therefore they were okay to offer him his jobs. And so he declined those job offers started his own company and used it as a way over the, over the entire time it was open as a place to give people job opportunities to, he taught you know, chemistry and he taught it at Harris Stowe and at, um, at SLU, I think at WashU as well. Like he has this very interesting, big life. Um, his company invented and manufactured the first water-free hand sanitizer. He invented a way to plasticize aviation fuel and he developed treatments for leukemia and cancer all out of this building. And he, like I said, he used the, the company as a way to open up job opportunities. And here is a picture of, have a little glitch, there we go. Click, there we go. The historic building when it was the do good uh, company. And this is, Lincoln Do Good, that was his last name, D-I-U-G-U-I-D. And so he called the company Do Good, D-U hyphen good. And that was him. And it's an advertisement for his hand sanitizer, which is kind of interesting now for our lives, of course. Um, although the hand cleaner removed paint, tar, stains. Yeah, kind of interesting stuff. I mean, I love the ad for the opportunities for wide awake salesmen. <laughs> no, no sleepy salesman at this place. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I would love follow up, and I'll, I'll, I will put my, uh, put my contact information uh, if anybody wants to follow up and ask questions later on this. All right. So our next stop. Let's fly again. So this one is gonna, we're gonna head over to the Central West End. Just gonna drop in, drop a little dude in there. And so this building, it was originally, you know, a bank, now a bank, well, originally it still is a bank, but it was also the home in the it's also the final home of a, of a school that has total, it's lady that I'm about to talk about. She's been dropped off the historic record, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bring her back. So this is the school that she ran opened in 1950 and her, and this is the lady here with the glasses and the pearls and her name, which just sounds like such the perfect name, Gretchen Vanderschmidt. And Gretchen, Gretchen Vanderschmidt moved to St. Louis in 1950 um, actually, she moved here a little bit earlier than that to work at a secretarial school. She moves here from Kansas. And then in 1950, she purchases the school and reorganizes it as a nonprofit organization. And what she was going to do with her school was pretty revolutionary at the time. And what she did was that she partnered with corporations to train workers from lower income areas and um, lower income high school graduates to, they were trained in the secretarial arts, you know, and this was men and women. 
Um, the nonprofit worked to end, its purpose was to end the generational cycles of welfare dependence and to offer job and life skills training as well as just the, as just the secretarial stuff. One of the things it does before anybody else does is it offers programs to teach those with disabilities, such as they had special programs for the blind, they helped with job placement, um, and the students were all integrated into the school's programming. They were not kept separate. So everyone was leaning together. It was integrated racially. It was integrated along different, uh, you know, people with different abilities. Um, so she's doing some interesting work. She was the first secretarial school in St. Louis to admit black students. And that happened before schools were legally desegregated. So she's doing this interesting work. Um, here she is on the right. There's Miss Gretchen Vanderschmidt, and she did. She devoted her entire life to this. And she never had children. She didn't marry. Um, she herself was the president um, of an organization called Altrusa International. Um, she was their international president, and they have observer status at the United Nations. So she was not. No, I'm not sure when she slept or did anything else. Um, the school died, the school closed after she died. She died in the early 1990s and it lasted until about the early 2000s and that's when it dies. But um, yeah, that, and again, it was located in that building where the Bank of America is located now. They had, they had office space there that's where the school was. And you can still find lots of people referencing their experiences here and the training and the life skills that she offered as well. Gretchen Vanderschmidt. All right. We move again. From there. Where am I taking this? Oh yeah, we're going to the loop. When we drop down here, I've got a, a view, you know, of all that group. I know that's full now, but a view looking, looking west on the loop. And here is that same view in the mid 20th century. So a minute of, or a second of trivia, you know, everybody, it's pretty common knowledge that the loop means the streetcar went out and turned around and came back, that it was a loop. I'd love to you know, ask the group, does anybody know what it was that that streetcar was taking people out to? Because the streetcar predated University City. No, it was not Creek Court Lake because it was turning around there near where the, uh, right now where the City Hall building is. So it's something that was located right there that people would be coming out to from the city. All right, so it would be taking people to Del Mar Gardens. And Del Mar Gardens is one of the early amusement parks and they're called, they're called trolley parks. And so the different ones around town, you know, the trolleys were taking people to these amusement parks. So Del Mar Garden had several big roller coasters. It had bandstands, it had, and it was really nice and red tiled roofs and, and actually pretty architecture as well. Um, it opened in the very early 1900s and it closed in 1919. So the picture on the upper right, if you can orientate yourself, you're looking west. So you're looking at City Hall, St. Louis, or University City, City Hall. And if you see that kind of, that area towards the bottom of that photograph that looks cleared, that's where the amusement park was. That's the footprint of the amusement park. And so while it was open, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show came in 1902. They had events here that were connected to the World's Fair when that was going on. And there was also a racetrack that was attached to the park. And the racetrack, now you can see evidence of it when you are driving down Delmar. And if you see the street Eastgate and Westgate, those are direct references to the gates to the, to the racetrack that was attached to the amusement park. And then here is one of the one of the rides. This is the aerial auto racer. And when I first saw this photo, I thought, holy crap, people are putting their cars on roller coasters and riding them. Like that sounds amazing. <laughs> but I did my research and found out that no, that was just that's they retro they retrofitted cars <laughs> to be able to ride on the roller coaster. 
not as fun as I thought it was originally, but still. And so, yeah, this was the, one of their big roller coasters that was there at Del Mar Gardens. So it's interesting that that you know, senior living facility is sitting right there where the, where the amusement park was. And this living facility is called Del Mar Gardens. But that name is originally refers to an amusement park. Here's another image looking east off the top upper levels of University City City Hall. You can see the roller coasters and the racetracks and everything off to the left. So you're looking, um, looking east here. This was a hotel that was built for the World's Fair. It's now a uh, student or it's apartments used by WashU. And there's the um, there's a neighborhood cluster of houses, a big, big houses there that are being built. This building is the only one, other than this one, of all this stuff, this building here is the only one still still standing. And that is where Craft Alliance was. It's the oldest building in the loop. Check my chat, no chats, no questions. All right, we're gonna move from here. We're gonna go north. So we're gonna head up to Fairgrounds Park you know, at Grand and Natural Bridge. There are lots of articles out there about the fact that if you go to Grand Avenue and Natural Bridge Road, you can see the bear pit off to the side. So if you haven't seen them head up there, you'll see these kind of castle looking things off to the, in the background. So this is what they originally looked like. And usually that's where it all stops. Like people say, the bear pits, there was a zoo. Okay, I was able to find, let's skip, let's skip those two for time, more images of the zoo. So this is the, uh, this one here is the, is the aviary building. So this was the aviary part of the original zoo. Here's another picture of the garden that was in front of the bear pits there. This is the carnivore house from 1878. So lions and tigers were up in Fairgrounds Park. And then this is the monkey house. And all of this architecture was lost in the early 20th century. After the World's Fair, the Fairgrounds Park stopped being uh, a distant, the same kind of destination and the city purchased it. And then you have the art museum. This was the art museum part of that, that park, a Fairgrounds Park um, that featured art, you know, paintings and, and changing displays. And for some reason, the day this photograph was made, there's like, uh, cemetery tombstones out front. I don't have I don't have any context on that one, but uh, this was the art art building. Let's see. Okay. And I think we're gonna move to our next to last place. Oh yeah. So if you've been, you know, I'm sure you've all been here. So. We're gonna look at uh, some buildings that are pretty prominent in the downtown skyline. And that's the Crunden Martin Industrial Complex. This was originally, I think over five, I think it's like seven buildings originally. There's very few left of this. This was one of the largest manufacturers in the country of, and this was opened in the early 1900s. It was designed by a very prominent architecture firm. And Crunden Martin was a, was the biggest of the wooden ware and wooden ware and uh, and what's the other one? Oh, and baskets and things like that. So they're making like wooden bowls, wooden spoons, different things like that, as well as weaving baskets and it's called willow ware. So wooden ware and willow ware. And then they get into during World War II, they get into the business of making uh, hats for soldiers. So the metal you know, protective hats. They also make gas cans for the war effort. Um, then they get into the business of making go-karts and then they were, so they're making like all kinds of crazy things over their history. And then by the uh, mid of the 20th century, they are making kites. So they start making paper bags and paper kites. And here's kind of a, the best image. This is from a letterhead from the company. So it's not amazing res, but um, this is the, the original complex for Clinton Martin. And so they're, by the end of their, their run, they closed in the 1990. Um, they were making lunch bags and school supplies and they were one of the last major manufacturers of paper kites in the country. Um, interestingly, St. Louis was actually at the center of paper kite making in the early 20th century. There's the production lines. 
the guy that originally built the Crendon Martin uh, complex, he was with his money, he put it back into the community, he was a big supporter of arts organizations and, and city beautification. And he paid for a large playground to be put. There were some abandoned buildings. This is in 1907. There were some abandoned buildings near the riverfront, uh, near the complex where the factory was. He had those buildings taken down and he built a large playground for neighborhood kids because this is still a residential area. And he also provided bathhouses and showers, or he provided showers for the kids um, from the neighborhood. And, um, and there was over a thousand kids that were using that playground using those facilities. And he also opened up one of the buildings just for them to use when it rained. It was a, it was a hall, like a covered, covered area that had been industrial that he let them use as a play space when it rained. And there's the, some of those paper kites that were made there at Crendon Martin. So that's the end of my quick rush, you know, quick flying through St. Louis. Um, I'd love to take any questions that you guys have about any of that stuff or any other St. Louis history things. I talk, I cover everything from drinking history to tornadoes to colonial, colonial history. So there's a, a burning St. Louis history question you've always wanted to ask. We've got a historian here. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. I love the tour. It was great. I was wondering if you could possibly consider adding uh, uh, in the tour the uh, history on the Matthew Dickey Boys and Girls Club, beginning at uh, Natural Bridge and King uh, Natural Bridge and Shreve, uh, where now it's also sitting on King's Highway today near 70. That's a great suggestion. That's a really great suggestion. And definitely when we're doing our bus tours, we head up into that area as well. So that's something I'd love to look at, con you know, connect over uh, once those get started. I know Mr. Matthews would be very, it would be amazing part of the history. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where do I find most of the details? Yeah, libraries, history museum. Um, I, Mara is asking a question about where I get all of my information. I spend a lot of time on newspapers.com. Uh, finding stuff because I'm naturally drawn to histories that are not already written. Um, just like with my tour of underground St. Louis, you know, people are always asking me like, can you get me in a cave? And I've been asked that enough times that I've, I kind of wanted, I wrote a tour that was about everything but caves, you know, that also goes along with our geology. So I tend, I, I have to dig a lot through, um, a lot through newspapers.com, a lot of primary sources through the Library and Research Center, through the the Missouri Historical Society. They're amazing. They have people on staff that you just email them like, hey, I'm trying to find something about this, like Gretchen Vanderschmidt. You know, I, get, I sent her, her, sent them her name and they, they found me all of this, this great stuff. So that is a place that, I, um, that I'm always digging through. I try to do as many primary sources as I can um, to find, find, find these little stories. Um, and are the extant buildings protected by landmarks? If, are you, are you, James, are you uh, referring to Crendon Martin? Yes, as well as the, uh, the uh, remaining oldest building uh, on the, in the U City Loop. So I, I know that Crendon Martin uh, applied for national, for register status and got it. Um, and then one of the buildings burned in 2015. Um, but I don't know about that, the, Craft Alliance building. I'm sure that I, I would think that it has. I know it was renovated uh, by Mackie Mitchell in the 90s when, they, when Craft Alliance went in. That's who renovated it. So I would think they could, um, that it has historic status, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And that's a good point. I use historic register nomination forms all the time. Like that is, that's one of my, it's also a source that I use that I can be sure that I'm getting the right info. Well, I guess if there are no other questions, if we can give Amanda a round of applause for an excellent tour of St. Louis and providing, honestly, us all um, as history buffs often do much information that we did not know and now we do. Um, 
Um, I mean, that was wonderful. And we will definitely, um, unfortunately, the recording as uh, you do this um, routinely, uh, this will not be a recorded um, component that will be available to membership. So if you want to catch her tours, you'll have to uh, catch up with her in the Missouri Historical Society. I think the tours are about um, 10 bucks or 15 bucks or something, something like that. Yeah, they're yeah. We do walking tours, and we're still doing them, they're, and they're still selling out. So even though it's cold and frigid outside, we're still doing sold out walking tours of Old North, Central West End, downtown, um, Soulard, all over the place, and they're all available as private tours for small groups, or the public tours only go up to nine people. So I'm I'm always doing doing history stuff out there, and I can put my contact information in the chat. Or can I? Where'd it go? Where'd it yeah, go? yeah. Okay. Um, well, I just want to give you a round of applause. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. And just um, a few other items. So we. So that was um, to wrap up the final uh, luncheon. I'll need to check with um, our professional development if that is uh, could be um, CM credit worthy or eligible or not. So we will follow up uh, with membership in the weekly e-blast for that. Um, as we went through earlier, we uh, were joined by the award winner, the planning award winners for 2020. Uh, as we had um, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Hi, Matthews on, um, as well as Brian Hurd, as you Brian see on the here. screen with the award. We have also had uh, the Jefferson Gravoy. A few people. Uh, we also had the Jefferson Gravoy Neighborhood Awards, the uh, St. Louis, I'm sorry, St. Charles County uh, won the planning award as well, and Dr. Sarah Coffin. Uh, won the, it was awarded the uh, Dwight F. Davis Planning Award. Uh, before I go just into your board members, I, I'm just going to note um, just a few lessons learned uh, as a section president um, is this area is, it expands from, you know, St. Louis, St. Charles, and what I've learned, um, it goes well beyond, honestly, uh, uh, the St. Louis region goes beyond um, St. Charles even. Uh, you start, if you drive out on Highway 70, on Highway uh, 40 or 64, um, 55, St. Louis, yeah, I don't want to use the term sprawl. I mean, it's there. You know, there are many communities that are represented on the board um, that aren't St. Louis hyper local focus. And um, these are communities, there are a lot of people and I see this uh, recognizing the opportunities for planners. Uh, planning really will need planners to accommodate, um, you know, the new developments in Wentzville, the infill development between areas like, you know, um, Edwardsville and Highland, Illinois, there are areas in between that will, uh, you know, just keep, um, that will just keep going and just, they'll have more people, they'll have more schools, they'll have a need for more jobs, but there will also be a bigger need for planning, especially as, um, especially as we go in, um, just with all the development that happens sporadically and sometimes unequally throughout the area, we need planners to really lead these um, these towns, these cities from local levels to the state level to even federal level. So um, look forward to the opportunity that comes before you. Um, and with that said, um, thank you for just bearing with us throughout the COVID year. Um, St. Louis has lost many people um, in the last few months. So is the, you know, the world. Um, and a lot of those deaths hit us, you know, close to home here, but we still progress. Um, you know, hopefully you guys are staying safe either at home or in your offices and uh, just keep wearing masks. But um, I just want to thank the board membership as well um, 
for repivoting the board to an online uh, format such as Zoom, and that we had a few um, really nice programs for the last couple of months. So I just wanted to go through those sections numbers now. Um, Justin Randall, he's with the city of Allen, Illinois. He's your next section president, and he's our current vice president. We have Jessica Henry, she's with RISE, and she is your next vice president and also uh, the current secretary. We have Jacob Trimble, he's with St. Louis County, and he's also the uh, current treasurer along, along with the Missouri State Section Director for the St. Louis Metro Section. We have Mr. John Cruz, he's with RISE, and he's your next uh, secretary. Susan Herrera, and she's with Susan Herrera in architecture and urban planning, and she's a board member at large. We have Todd Stryler with Stryler Planning. He's uh, I'm not going to name all the um, chairs that we have, but he's the awards chair, and he did an outstanding job this year. Um, he worked well with uh, the idea of Jess Henry, who is the, uh, our incoming VP, she um, switched the awards and um, went to third degree glass factory. So he has also had the pleasure of working with her on that, but also to uh, leading the awards team and who goes through and picks um, who um, is recognized for the award. So I want to thank Todd as well for that. Dr. Sarah Coffin, she's with St. Louis University. Zach Gradens, and he's with the city of Bridgeton. Andrea Rigante, she's with Fairview Heights. Matthew Bernstein, and he's with Washington University, a professor there. Steve Strickland, he's with um, O'Fallon, Missouri. Bonnie Harper, who's with the Open Space Council. Wes Hayde with SWT Design. Christy Volker with America Central Port. Brianna Buncher with Madison County. And the next two members, uh, Michael Zeke, uh, Michael Zeke with Maryland Heights. Um, he's officially, he's not a voting board member, but he serves as our professional development officer for the St. Louis area and attends the monthly meetings as well. And Scott Hanson, who's also not a voting member, but he's our uh, past St. Louis Metro section uh, president, as well as the Illinois State Section Director. And this uh, 2021 year, we'll have a few, uh, a few of those I just mentioned will be transitioning off and coming in um, for the next, for the next year, we'll be, uh, we'll be joined with, by Rachel Witt with South Grand Jonathan Raish with the um, city of Kirkwood. Adam Jones with PGAV. Gary Newcomer with Community Builders Network. Brianne Spirano with City of Highland, Illinois. Sean Tooley with the Missouri Department of Transportation. and Lucas Stradmeyer with uh, Jacobs. So your board is in very bright hands. And with that, I say thank you for allowing me to be um, your president for the last 18 months. And for the time that, um, you know, for the, for the people who I remember going into the first meeting and I had a Surface laptop and I didn't know that you just, you know, how the screen pops up. So the surface was just lying there flat and, and it just looked ridiculous. So I walked in with, um, you know, being a novice and I'm walking out, uh, leaving with a bunch of um, bright and just wonderful board members and friends. So I just want to say thank you for that. And uh, we'll see you for our next program, hopefully in January. And with that, you have a happy holidays to you. And have a good day. Yeah.